Elden Ring is one of the best games I have ever played, and it's a title I couldn't pull myself away from for weeks. I haven't felt this way about a game since Death Stranding, so I'm already very comfortable saying that this is my game of the year for 2022. The combat remains as high quality as any of the Souls games, with larger than life battles and a staggering amount of different bosses to be defeated. As far as dark fantasy RPGs go, this is one of the greatest experiences you can have. It can be crushing at times, but the triumphant embrace of victory when conquering a boss that at first seemed impossible becomes an addiction. The open world houses enormous dynamic battlefields to satisfy any hardcore high fantasy fans' wishes, as you do battle with legendary dragons and demigods. To me, this is FromSoft's game that's most full of life in comparison to the Souls games, whose atmospheres are mostly quite oppressive, save for hub areas. There's so much beauty to be found in Elden Ring in a lot of ways, even if it's bittersweet. And for a game known for gruelling boss battles and dying a bunch of times, I want to explore everything that doesn't come under that category of discussion. There's a lot more tenderness in Elden Ring than I expected, both thanks to my approach to the game and to the lovingly crafted world of the lands between. My time with Elden Ring was actually deeply relaxing, with plenty of moments taken to appreciate the serenity that the game offers to those who stop to observe it. As expected, there's considerable darkness and danger in this world, but there's also an abundance of beauty to keep the balance. My approach to the lands between made me feel like I was a tourist. The very first thing I did upon entering each area was look around for a map fragment, which is shown as a small symbol in an otherwise blank section of the map. With my new, more detailed view of each region, I could zoom into any points of interest and set markers of my own. Whether it looked like a fort, some ruins, or a cave of some sort, there was never any instance where it wasn't worth travelling to my scouted destination. On my way to these points of interest, I would use my map to take note of bosses that I'll come back for later, NPCs I want to remember the locations for, and also stone sword statues, all while unlocking lost graces along my path. I know that the NPC locations are now patched in, but I kinda preferred my experience without them. It was the most use I made of any video game map, which worked so well given the sheer amount of content available. My collection of optional boss and catacomb markers grew as I progressed, and I went back to these places whenever I felt like it, and removed them once completed. If I had a bunch of markers unloaded onto my map right from the start, I would have been immensely overwhelmed. Not only that, but I wouldn't have analysed the map or my surroundings quite so vigorously, which unravelled an adoration for video game cartography I never knew I had. In most cases, I had a pretty good overview of what I could do in an area before properly interacting with any of it, thanks to the geographic shapes on display. If an area on the map seemed a little empty, chances are there's something I hadn't found yet. And more often than not, I'd find a catacomb or optional boss tucked away into some corner I'd never naturally find myself in. As much as examining your physical surroundings can hint at more hidden elements of the environment, the map can also unveil suspicious areas worth checking out. From its detail and shading, you can see ledges you normally wouldn't travel down, and small buildings or ruins you might have missed. It will tell you there's something over there, but not exactly what which helps grow your curiosity. A more simplified map wouldn't convey the geographical language needed to find areas to scout. It's all presented in a fantasy style, etched lines in ink and what looks like a watercolour texture underneath, with variations in colour to denote grassy, sandy or woodland areas, for example. This kind of map wouldn't work in, say, a competitive esports game where the map is located on screen at all times to only give you the information necessary. Pathways, teammates, and enemy locations. Elden Ring's map, on the other hand, serves the purpose of being supplementary to the explorative nature of the game, and thus provides you with the visual guidance for that. 
There are even telescopes that can give you more extensive views within the 3D space. So the game supplies you with quite a few tools to seek out as much content as possible. As my playthrough advanced, I always found myself jumping between areas I had unlocked, trying my hand at bosses I previously couldn't beat once I had leveled up a bit. It was something that kept my attention and allowed me to easily lose myself in the game for hours a day, because I never felt like I was being restricted to one place. I could weave between them with their different aesthetics and enemies, watching my collection of markers decrease as I did everything I could find. My exploration felt rewarded at every turn, not just through my use of the map, but through my engagement with what the world had to offer. Whenever I felt like getting back on track with the main story, I could check the graces that show the way to a main boss or point of interest, or maybe just sit down and bask in the warm pink sunset. As I searched for things to fill my map with, I noticed the finer details of these lands, and that's something which grew tenfold when it came to collecting footage for this video. I revisited my favourite locations in the game, as if returning to a good vacation, taking screenshots and clips of the tiny parts that form the beating heart of Elden Ring's landscapes. Thanks to PC mods allowing extensive photo mode options, I could get even closer to the intricacies of nature and character designs. I could watch giant crabs scooping up worms to eat, and get closer to both friends and foes, seeing their elaborate designs in striking clarity. I could revisit immense bosses no longer obscured by their fast movements as they tried to kill me. So the first I returned to with my new tools was the Ancestor Spirit Boss, a fight I remembered for its bewitching music majestic adversary, and the battlefield with a stalactite ceiling and shallow watery carpets. Seeing these spaces designed for combat be morphed into a tranquil living space made me look at these places through a new lens. During my playthrough, I came across the enormous walking mausoleums with their thundering footsteps, and quelled their anger by cleaning the skull-like buildup on their feet. In return, they would lower themselves back down to earth, allowing entry into their structure. I interpreted it as a subsiding rage at its discomfort, thanking you with the abilities of its innards. I could often easily spot a mausoleum from a distance due to its size, but for those that carry a bell, you'll also hear its ringing echo through its field. In addition to this, certain enemies will sing songs of their own that are hauntingly beautiful, and I would be careful not to interrupt so I could enjoy the sound. While you're travelling around, you may be guided by the sweet melody of the violins of lone merchants. I couldn't help but stand and listen as they adorned the air with their music. These merchants are sometimes shy and apologetic, and I'd always buy something from them even if I didn't need anything, since their demeanour alone made me want to help. There are also charming moments to be shared with NPCs throughout the game. Iron Fist Alexander, the large, sentient pot with arms and legs will find himself stuck in the ground, tasking you with getting him out. Ah. Well played, good sir. Well played. Most notably, Box Quest has a good ending that you can achieve with one simple extra step. His character initially feels inadequate in terms of his physical appearance. And on my first run through of his questline, he visited Renala to be rebirthed, but unfortunately died after the procedure. However, using a prattling pate, you're able to call him beautiful sometime before then, so he doesn't feel the need to be rebirthed, thus saving his life. You're beautiful. You think I'm beautiful, despite these looks? <laughs> Master. Even aggressive bosses have their own endearing moments too, with Radan learning to harness the power of gravity itself so he wouldn't have to leave his horse who is comically smaller than him. It's nice to find this side of characters who you wouldn't expect to have any compassion for anything as they probably kill you over and over again. There's a certain area north of the Altus Plateau that is home to a village with windmills, and within it are non-hostile dancing ladies just having a good old time. 
It's a little creepy, but still kind of nice to observe people just existing in these realms. Another example of this is where an isolated wolf was laying down next to a corpse in a chair, and I can't help but think that maybe that was its owner. The wolf still shows its loyalty by remaining by their side, which is very bittersweet. Just like fierce hugs that are warming to receive, but also give you a health-reducing debuff. There are a few tributes to Berserk, which served as a huge influence to Miyazaki's work, and whose creator, Kentaro Miura, unfortunately passed away last year. You can locate similar imagery and also a character and sword design that bear great resemblance to that of the protagonist of Berserk. Elden Ring's characters and environmental storytelling can sometimes reveal heartwarming tales. And if there's one observation that I picked up from the game that I think describes this perfectly, it's that flowers bloom even on battlefields. One thing that was most notable to me during my time in the Lands Between was its striking resemblance to certain artworks, particularly those of the Romanticism movement. During this period of art history, the exploration of the intangible, emotions, and the subconscious took centre stage. Around this time, people began to go hiking in an attempt to explore the natural world. It was not, however, the true reality of the natural world which they intended to discover, but the way it made them feel. The paintings of the Romantics were intense and expressive, with a heavy emphasis on landscapes and nature, and subsequently, the smallness of man in the face of it. Stepping into Leonia for the first time and seeing the view before you is beyond breathtaking, instilling a sense of futility into you as you peer into the distance, wondering what awaits you at those faraway structures. Caspar David Friedrich's Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog could not be more relatable in this moment. A mixture of freedom, dread, emotion, and awe swells up inside of you, until you eventually succumb to stillness. In a post discussing game design and Friedrich's romanticism, Anjan Anhutz describes stillness as Moments in which the player stops doing stuff with the controller and rather lets their mind contemplate the game ahead or the game so far. This is frequently done via cutscenes, menus, and loading screens, and if the level designers are smart, they carefully guide the player to the necessary platforms to take in the vistas organically during gameplay. This is something Elden Ring does a lot. Those natural moments of stumbling into something so beautiful yet daunting were times where I just had to stop to take it all in, but that stillness doesn't only come from what the game gives you for free. The other method for achieving tranquility is to clear an area of a boss and or its smaller enemies. This restores a peace of mind to explore the environment more, making the land a safer, less hostile place. Once you've defeated your adversaries, you're able to view these spaces not as a platform for battle, but instead as calm, picturesque scenes. Another subject of many painters of the Romantic era was that of ruins a fitting motif when contemplating the triumph of nature against mankind. I spent a lot of time in the dilapidated churches scattered throughout the lands between, examining their broken walls and columns, envisioning the interiors and inhabitants in an effort to capture the glory they may have once carried. The destructive capabilities of time and nature do not diminish the beauty and drama of the ruins. They sit motionless, urging you to ponder all that time has inflicted upon them. The force of nature seeps even into the great cities of the lands between. Lendel, situated at the base of the Great Ur Tree, is bound in roots and branches. They're embedded into the architecture and culture of the city, evident by the fact that there are tapestries, flags, and engravings on doors depicting the tree. There are even bunches of branches hanging from ceilings, and many potted plants being grown in the city, which makes me think that the residents tended to them as a form of respect to their leafy deity. There are a couple rooms in Lendel that are almost completely overgrown, with roots stretching across the floor and ceiling, sprouting greenery and yellow flowers which I assume are a result of the Ur tree's close proximity. The roots stretch further than just the city surface, as there are many that twist into the depths of the underground piercing the abyss even there. The Halic Tree, separate to the Ur Tree, has a city of its own built around it, as opposed to the roots in Lendel penetrating the architecture. 
From these visuals alone, we can see the timelines of these places and what came first. There are also creatures that resemble trees such as the Ur tree avatars, tree sentinels, and tree spirits. Some are made up of bark and branches, whereas others bear the symbol of the tree in their armour. Even the map highlights the presence of trees through the gold miner ur trees, forests, and of course, the hulking ur tree in the middle that is visible no matter where you are overground. The power of the tree, and by extension nature, is baked into the world. It's an unmissable symbol of romanticism, the force of nature that has prevailed over mankind's structures and now demands their reverence. However, the influence of Romanticism isn't only in the natural landscapes or overgrowth, but also the style of architecture itself. Romanticism expressed itself in architecture primarily through imitations of older architectural styles and through eccentric buildings known as follies. Medieval Gothic architecture appealed to the Romantic imagination in England and Germany, and this renewed interest led to the Gothic Revival. There are undeniable Gothic influences throughout the cities of the lands between, with characteristics including flying buttresses, pinnacles, and ornate decorations, punctuating the landscape with structures of haunting opulence. The architecture of Elden Ring is akin to many old artworks of great cities and ruins. In fact, the Romantics themselves frequently looked back to the Middle Ages, which they considered a better, far less industrial period. Architectural painting experienced a surprising revival in the first half of the 19th century, which was triggered by the fact that medieval architecture itself had become charged with a highly emotional significance. These testaments of past greatness and daring awakened feelings of nationalism, patriotism, romanticism, and even religious devotion. And that's sometimes what I think about when I look at these fallen cities, what they once were and the prosperity that came with it. How great must it have been during times of peace before the shattering? The cities themselves are filled with history. Lendl's dragon coiled around its centre along with a giant spear depicts the legendary tale well known to this city. There's an obvious history that lives in these spaces, and although the more modern architectural sites have been standing since long before your player's existence, there are some areas that feel even more ancient. You'll find the influence of ancient Greece and Rome through columns, statues, and temples. Places that seem so much older than the contemporary overground, with its gothic, cathedral-style buildings. All throughout the lands between, there are colossal towers, bridges, and staircases, even enormous arenas. There's no shortage of statues of important figures and remnants of religions from bygone eras. These past places of worship, like the Cathedral of Dragon Communion and Churches of Marica, are now in ruins but show the diverse and time-worn history of these lands. There is an abundance of wonder to be found in Elden Ring's environments. Even the destructive beauty of Scarlet Rot gives Kaelid its blood-red skies and festering landscape of odd creatures and otherworldly plants. The snow-covered mountaintops of the giants are home to icy lakes and blizzard-ridden fields, and sinking buildings surround the treacherous pools of lava where Volcano Manor stands. The verticality of this world is stunning, from its astonishingly high walls to the wretched sewers below, and further down still to the subterranean wells that conceal impossibly vast starry skies. Each of these varied locales harbors its own sense of beauty, even amongst the chaos. The different regions in the game are each home to their own species of wildlife, even in the most uninhabitable sections, you can expect fauna of some kind, instilling a slight hopefulness in the player as even a delicate butterfly can thrive in scorching flames. The subtle, inviting glows of plants and insects let you know from a considerable distance that they can be picked up, rather than littering the screen with outlines or markers during gameplay. It's a kind of guiding light similar to graces and multiplayer messages, something kind to help you on your journey in an unkind world. While the crafting system wasn't something I actually utilised very often, the little prompts showing what I had picked up taught me so much about the wildlife. It highlighted the species that could be found in the world, educating me on the names of them to the point where I could detect them by sight in the wild. 
Without the crafting mechanics, these plants would have just been another element in the environment that I would have no reason to pay attention to, and so I subconsciously adopted the role as an amateur botanist of the lands between. It felt like there was a functional ecosystem, with different types of flowers growing in all kinds of environments. The fire blossoms on the mountaintops of the giants are fertilised by the sparks from the forge at the peak, where burns the flame of ruin. Pink poison bloom grows in toxic terrain, and the blood rose flourishes in blood-soaked soil. Life is affected by the presence of the great Erd tree, as the early flower is said to be fed by leaves that fell from the tree in days of antiquity. The golden sunflower and rower fruit grow closer to Erd trees, tinged with the golden glow from its source. Even Melania is the origin of a life form, as according to myth, the Aeonian butterflies were once the wings of the goddess of rot herself. While most of the living creatures you come across will be hostile, some are peaceful or even timid. You'll come across grazing boar and deer, skittish rabbit gurus and passive turtles. Perhaps you may stumble upon giant lobsters and ants, or maybe get teleported into a forest of enormous bears. Regardless, nature seems to be on your side despite everything whether through resources to craft items that will aid you in battle, or the small trees that harbour golden seeds that increase your health, the wildlife helps you on your quest. Even stat-boosting talismans hold amber that's made from the Earth Tree's old sap. There will be instances of creatures and enemies interacting with each other, often fighting in what feels like a persisting world regardless of your actions and the temperamental weather and day-to-night cycles bring about an organic landscape that feels indifferent to your presence. It's a world that exists with or without you, which is a huge testament to how full of life the lands between are, and just how much work went into achieving that. Navigating the harsh worlds of the Souls games isn't something you have to do alone. Players can help each other through both asynchronous multiplayer and co-op, so long as you play online. For me, I only found hidden walls in Elden Ring because of messages left by others, although most of them were lying. But even then, getting tricked into smacking a very real and solid wall was pretty funny. There were strange actions that led me to secret areas or bosses I never would have found on my own. Sometimes a message would show me safe areas to jump from when nervously platforming over wooden beams and cliffs, or tips and strategies for beating the bosses that lie ahead. Often there were warnings of ambushes around the corners of catacombs and castles, saving you from what could have been a sudden, unexpected death. The glowing white messages are a symbol of the player's joint experience and struggle, a reminder that you're not alone in your gruelling adventure. Seeing the ghosts of others making their way through the game just like me, and watching their ghostly silhouettes fight the same enemies I was struggling with was encouraging often giving me the drive I needed to keep pushing past adversity. Even in what you'd expect to be the loneliest corner in the world, it's highly likely that you'll still find a message. So as much as the world and its cruelty may feel isolating, the asynchronous multiplayer provides a comforting feeling, and tells you that you are capable, just like everyone else you see the trails of. Even having your own messages appraised means you receive a small amount of healing, and in that way, leaving notes around the world, whether helpful or comical, will be beneficial to both you and others. Many elements of the multiplayer functions are lighthearted too, like seeing messages in weird places and thinking how the hell someone got up there, or interacting with a bloodstain and simply watching someone take a wrong step and fall to their death, which can be a good warning or just plain hilarious. Having random strangers join my co-op session with that brief moment of spamming block moves or running in circles before going through the fog walls never failed to make me smile. And the engagement of basic conversation through gestures and prattling pates is limited, but always succeeds in expressing camaraderie. The funny messages next to items and NPCs in the world even transcend the game, and gain popularity on social media with very creative ways of forming words and sentences that aren't options in the list. Common jokes and phrases have been a mainstay in the series from the very beginning, and that just goes to show the strength of the shared connection that players have. Through all these multiplayer aspects, 
There's a great sense of community both in-game and online. There's a lot of kindness to be found in this alone, and can alleviate much of the oppressive nature of Elden Ring and all the Souls games. When I eventually felt well equipped enough to help others, I would put down my summon sign and have a lot of fun assisting those who were struggling with the same bosses I dealt with. Successfully defeating the area boss alongside your summoner rewards you with a rune arc, which is very useful in temporarily boosting stats. But ultimately, I took more joy in just the idea of aiding somebody. To play Dark Souls multiplayer is to think, someone I don't know might need my help, so I better help them. What this means is that all over the world, both our world and Dark Souls' world, there are these players with incredibly powerful characters just standing around and waiting to help people. Imagine someone walking through a neighborhood, knocking on doors, and asking people if they need any help with their housework. That is the kind of person who plays Dark Souls multiplayer. Forget Journey, this is the most beautiful thing I think a game has ever shown me about humanity. With Elden Ring's camera being in third person and my character on screen at pretty much all times, it was very important to me that they were well dressed. I'm not alone in this either, as there are entire subreddits dedicated to this aspect of the game like Elden Bling and Fashion Souls. It's a huge part of the Souls experience for me and many others. Oftentimes, I would choose armour that looks good, as opposed to that which would probably be a lot more functional by raising certain stats. My reasoning for choosing the Prisoner class was purely down to the fact that I loved the helmet that looks like you got stung by bees, and during my playthrough I was always conscious of collecting as many wearable pieces as I could to expand my wardrobe. This extends to even farming certain enemies to obtain their loadout, as there's a chance that killing them might drop one or more of their wearable pieces. Matching sets are an easy option for a coherent look, but mixing different pieces can also result in a distinct yet methodical outfit. There are even alternate armour choices that you can change to with either tailoring tools or through Bok the Seamster, and most times it will just remove the cape or hood from a head or chest piece. Usually I choose one element of my outfit, like my helmet or weapons, and centre the rest of the equipment around that, experimenting with different silhouettes and texture combinations until I've achieved the perfect look. A lot of the armour is incredibly eccentric, with bejeweled and engraved detailing, embroidered capes and contrasting stitching. The headgear in Elden Ring is my favourite out of all the wearable equipment. The choices are varied and extremely detailed, with an abundance of options that can cater to the style you're going for. There are helmets with facial features, a facehugger-esque skeletal mask, and even more beast-like accessories such as horns, should you want to obscure your physical humanity a little bit. The pure attention to detail to the wearable items of Elden Ring blew me away. Take the Snow Witch hat, for example, with a tangled wire ribbon and an icy texture underneath its white cloth. This gargantuan, structured hat is sure to be the statement piece of your outfit. There are helmets with dragon ornaments perched on top, and their tails curled around its base. Or perhaps you prefer the sleek forms of tall, shiny helmets, with majestic, sprawling feathers. The Tree Sentinel helm appropriately has a small metal trunk growing at the top, with bristles imitating branches and leaves. There are also different arrangements of metal aside from solid chest pieces as you can get strings of golden beads and chainmail replicating cloth through its more flowy movement. Even if you'd rather wear something softer, there's no lack of choice through the amount of layered robes, shawls, and cloaks available in Elden Ring's catalogue. Souls games explore a different kind of fashion than what we're used to in reality, one that doesn't really appear off of catwalks and photo shoots. Hardcore fantasy fashion is treated as more of a costume in real life, so inhabiting a world where these styles are the norm makes it even more inviting. You're not going to stick out by wearing a giant pumpkin head helmet or a mask made up of tentacles. Even the most outlandish combination of equipment is welcome in the lands between. I mean, hell, you can even be a pile of mushrooms if you really want. Historically, Armour has been subject to trends and stylistic changes no different to ordinary clothes. It can be home to bizarre intricacies and impressive ornamental artistry, and unsurprisingly, 
FromSoft have taken inspiration from many real-life armour pieces for their games. In an article by Dr. Stefan Kraus for CodeArt, he describes the function of armour outside of the battlefield. Plate armour was one of the most expensive and most noble articles of men's clothing in the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance. It was worn not only in battle, but also at triumphal processions, parades, and festive tournaments. Armour documented its wearer's high social standing and his political and military power. The leading armourers of the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance were highly paid and respected artists, some of whom were even elevated to the nobility. Armours produced by these masters usually cost much more than a painting or a piece of sculpture. These extremely elegant and fashionable articles of clothing were laden with symbolism. They were, in fact, fashion made of steel. Real-life armour wasn't only used for battles, so it makes sense our relationship with it in Elden Ring follows suit. The sheer scale of Elden Ring is unlike anything from software has ever created. The Academy of Raya Lucaria, although occupying only a fraction of the gigantic map, is a world in itself. And the same goes for almost every main location in the game. What was once an entire level in Demon's Souls is now just a tiny mark on the overall view of what you can experience. Whether you've chosen to overcome tremendous odds the game presented to you alone or with the help of others, the feeling of prevailing over insurmountable challenges is worth the countless deaths and struggle you may face. The oppressive aspects of the game, like brutal bosses and story elements, help the light-hearted factors stand out more to me. Over the course of a hundred hours and counting, I played out my roles as a tourist, botanist, and fashionista. There's a lot of different ways to approach this game even without the combat or story being involved. I savoured every moment I spent high above the landscapes, watching the gentle breeze sweep across the living, breathing world in front of me. I peered through telescopes to see spectacular panoramas, and felt no shortage of awe when stumbling upon underground areas that, through pure scale, made me realise how big this game really is. This sprawling map is shared between a strong community of so many people wanting to help each other, and while the lands between are already so full of life, the players within it add even more personality to this animated melting pot of interconnected lore plentiful combats, and everything in between. So as much darkness as Elden Ring provides, there's an equal amount of beauty to behold.